Okay. Uh, take it away. Hey there, welcome to the March 30th episode of the Canadian Philosophy Show. I'm Hale, and with me is uh, Mike. And today we're going to be top talking about something that's always topical. Uh, freedom of speech. Mike, why don't we start it off by me asking you, when I say freedom of speech, what comes to mind? What do you think? What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, being the rebel that I am... Mm -hmm. Hale, Hale. What comes to mind for me is way back to the uh, uh, original premise of freedom of speech. Like, why, why is it something that we should have or do have? Why do we take for granted, it seems, in our culture that it's uh, some sort of uh, inalienable uh, human right or universal human right? I mean, I'm not saying it's not. But uh, true to my nature, I'd like to go way back and question the premise, and uh, uh, and it actually relates to uh, whether or not freedom of speech or free speech is some sort of human right. It relates to the question of um, whether morality is objective or subjective, whether mm -hmm. universal human rights are constructed by people in certain societies, or whether they are objectively and universalizable, uh, universalizably true. So we take for granted freedom of speech in, in, in our uh, democratic societies, but one could argue that uh, there shouldn't be freedom of speech. And, and uh, after we hear what you have to say, then I, uh, I'm going to cite Plato uh, as an example of, uh, <laughs> of, of, uh, yeah. of, of a well-known um, figure who uh, isn't so sure about freedom of speech. But go ahead, Hale. Yeah, no, no, I, I hear what you're saying. I think, first off, like, I think in our, in our current liberal democratic societies and all those iterations that we have, we all kind of work with some sort of premise of freedom of speech. Now, like, what that actually means in Canada or what that means in the U.S. or what that means in the U.K., that, those are where the, the, the degrees come in, right? So, like, when we when we allow for a certain degree of freedom of, of speech um essentially what does that mean what does that look like in each in each place and then when i think about okay what are the grounds of freedom of speech well i think what what are the what's effectively the mission statement what's the mission of a liberal democratic society and at least one of those missions is the respect for the individual as the individual as an individual and freedom of speech is a, is the sort of principle that most reflects that right? that individuals have uh differences in opinion and that those opinions essentially lead to differences in what they can say in the marketplace or forum of ideas and so that would be my and a starting point for me on on the top and then it gets a lot more in depth from there great actually i'm going to uh started at an even earlier point than I did before. Uh, and I uh, just wanted to define uh, what we mean by speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, now I'm, I'm going to be referring to a paper that I wrote, some research that I did several times during mm -hmm. the show. And this was when I was, uh, uh, like you, a student at VIU. In fact, I, I gave a paper uh, presentation at a uh, conference at uh, Thompson Rivers University. And that's what I did this research for. But anyway, I began my paper by simply defining what speech is. And it's not that hard to define it. And what I wrote here was that in ancient oral societies, speech literally referred to spoken word. Later, speech becomes the content of media, from writing to telephone, broadcasting, and yep. the internet, all components of the new oral society. And I quoted, uh, I think, uh, a media uh, author, Gasher. Anyway, um, so when we talk about freedom of speech, uh, just so it's clear, uh, we're talking about not just oral speech, we're talking about print media, digital media, that kind of thing. So that's actually where I would, would, would say, it would, would, that's what I would say is the beginning. Uh, and I think in all of those, the, that one word that comes to mind 
sure you brought up a lot of really interesting points, but one thing that comes to mind on, on my end when we think about freedom of speech is it's some is it sometimes is re uh, interpreted as, as freedom of expression, and I, I kind of think about when we when we think about freedom of speech and we think about what kind of limitations there are, if there are any limitations, and some people would argue that there shouldn't be any limitations at all. Um, there's really the whole there's kind of uh, it's what I think about it. I sort of think about a three step process. I think about there's the holding of an opinion, the holding of some kind of belief. There's the expression of that belief or opinion. Um, and then what was kind of what you were talking about there, the medium that that expression of opinion comes through is super varied to any kind of media. Um, and then there's, I think this is one of the key points that we sometimes get gets lost on us is there's the context of the expression of the opinion or belief. And I think that's really where it's that third part where really like most modern discussions about freedom of speech come into play is the context. Like who is in particular, who is saying uh, who is saying what to whom, when, where, and, and probably most importantly, why that being said. Yeah. I'm not sure at this point that I agree with part of what you said. I'm not sure I agree with the, uh, what I believe your claim was that uh, that the debate is largely over uh, where or a con context is that what you said? Uh, where where and and, and uh, under what circumstances? Hmm. Uh, I believe that's what you said. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not sure. I agree with that because uh, I think, and I'll get to this later for my research. Um, it became clear to me that there, there's uh, diverging uh, viewpoints about freedom of speech, di diverging uh, amounts of freedom, let's say, put it this way, between uh, Canada and the United States. I, I use those two countries as examples. And the, the fundamental difference, the fundamental distinction is not about uh, how something's said, but it's the actual content of, of what's, being, what's being said. It's the hmm. uh, uh, and what I'm referring to is the the the, the idea of hate speech. Totally, totally, so, yeah, and so, that's kind of a topical yeah example, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that uh, later, but um, I just I just wanted to allude to, to Plato because uh, uh, in my research I made the claim that Plato uh, was not an advocate of free speech. And uh, so Plato, of course, uh, in the Republic, talk, talked about four types of government, aristocracy, democracy, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny. That's five. One, two, three, four, five. Wow, I found a mistake in my paper. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we often associate freedom of speech with democracy. And I think Plato did too, but Plato did not advocate democracy. He he, t he described empirically democracy as a uh, a failed uh, system of government because it's not stable, and it eventually uh, is destined to uh, to deteriorate to, de to degenerate into tyranny. Of course, Plato advocated uh, uh, aristocracy as the most just and stable type of government. And, and of course, the aristocrats who would lead the government uh, were are philosopher kings. Uh, the super, the, the philosophical super beings to the higher yeah, order. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so having said that, um, he, he, did, he did not advocate uh, freedom of speech. Uh, he proposed in the Republic that um, speech and poetry, which by our new definition, we would include poetry and speech. But he said that in the Republic, they would not be permitted, uh, in his ideal state, would not be permitted to suggest that the gods are dishonest. It's a quote right out of uh, the Republic. And further, Plato is quoted in the Republic as saying that 
Poets and artists are restricted to producing content deemed acceptable by the state. So uh, that's the only point I wanted to make uh, at this point, is that our uh, great uh, uh, <laughs> mentor Plato, right? Our great uh, leader Plato, <laughs> the lead, great leader of, of, of in fact, perhaps founder of Western philosophy, um, mm. did not believe in freedom of speech. So it is possible. I'm not saying that I don't. It's possible. Uh, and in fact, we have a very credible uh, uh, authority, Plato, who, uh, who did not advocate anything close to freedom of speech by these, uh, according to these references, right out of the, of the Republic. And I mean, I think that would be where I think myself and a lot of people diverge. I mean, like, like I said earlier, I think that there is a um, direct uh, within that context of, of, of restriction um, well, it, there, there's obviously a stratification of, of society and, and in some sense of worth of, of individuals, right? And there's like, I can't remember it now, but you know, it's like the gold and silver, bronze souls. Basically, there's like a leveling of people, right? And and essentially, like some people are worth more or maybe a better way of saying it or more have a better access to the truth of things than um Others, whereas I think in our like current societies where this where this discussion is happening, there's a sort of baseline where we kind of say, look, like take everyone to have a certain degree of quality, not necessarily a quality of outcome, but a starting point of equality, and a starting point. Part of that starting point of equality is a starting point of uh, personal autonomy, and then. From there, freedom of speech is the way in which we sort of express that, that or realize that fact as being a major principle of our uh, liberal democratic um, societies and situations, right? So that's kind of would be my basic response to Plato. And then also, too, in response to kind of what I was saying earlier in that threefold distinction, I think that... Um, can kind of like we can picture it being like when I say the expression of expression of opinion, holding of an opinion, and expression of opinion in the context of the expression of the opinion. Now, this kind of gets into the distinction of like what is what is free speech all about? Like what are, like what are we basically what are we arguing over? Like, certainly, we're not asking questions about regulating what people think in their own heads, right? Um. And it doesn't really seem like we're also trying to regulate in some sort of weird 1984 style what people are saying in their own homes, right? Nobody really cares if I walk around my house muttering, you know, racist stuff or whatever. I mean, obviously, it's not a good thing. There's all sorts of reasons why, but that's not really what we're talking about. So then what we're talking about is those public forums of discussion then I think the question of free speech becomes what types of the of those public discussions are okay and I think that pro probably the most obvious like factor becomes intention and this is that classic you know, like what what am I trying to do with my speech right am I if I'm and there was actually interestingly we're obviously in Canada Canadian philosophy show to kind of jump into that there was actually a, an interesting case in Vancouver recently, some people may or may not have seen this in the news, where a highly conservative preacher was in the uh, Vancouver West Side um, with a, with a boombox or whatever, preaching about, um, you know, how being homosexual is, uh, is a sin, essentially. I'll, I'll admit, I, have, I don't know exactly what the person said, but that was from the articles, a general gist. Um, and it kind of came back from my understanding that, well, a lot of people could appreciate why that's super annoying and perhaps even disrespectful. Uh, the legislative bodies involved um, did not determine it to be hate speech um, because he was in a public space expressing opinion, but not, in, not necessarily inciting any type of action or violence. Um, and that really, it frankly pissed a lot of people off. Um, that de that determination, but I think it was a really nice little 
um, example of this kind of discussion, right? And this discussion becomes then like, what counts, uh, what kind of speech acts count as harmful or involving other people? How do they involve other people? And what counts as like, what it, like, obviously there's speech, speech acts like defamation, um, a lot, like straight up lies and things like that. But then there's also, you know, inciting violence and harm. Those are so obvious. But then there's the, the more thorny discussion becomes, what about psychological harm? What about offense? What about personal internal displeasure to what people are saying uh, or disagreement? What like what, what kind of boundaries do we have on regulation of that kind of speech in the public forum? Yeah, and uh, eventually this will lead me to uh, to discuss the what I found to be in my research the distinction between the American and the Canadian approaches. Um, but I I think. Uh, before we get into the distinctions, I think there's an underlying uh, issue, which is whether or not freedom of speech has an intrinsic value, or whether freedom of speech is either uh, justified by or constrained by practical considerations. And there's a difference there because if something has an intrinsic value, that intrinsic value or the upholding of, of an intrinsic right may uh, uh, outweigh or even um, trump, uh, trump not in the politics, <laughs> the ex-president -pres sense. When you, when you say that word, it, you know, when, when one says that word, it almost automatically now gets associated. Meaning it changed. Trump as in a game of, uh, um, what do you call it, bridge or something like that, right? Um, So, so there's a view of of freedom of speech that suggests or that holds that it's an intrinsic right, that it's one of the basic human rights. Now, this is totally contra Plato. So Plato uh, dismissed freedom of speech for practical reasons, right? I mean, he 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 thought that freedom of speech was associated with democracy, which is unstable and it's chaotic, and. Uh, and in the Republic, again, Plato had talked about democracy as being very tempting because it's colorful and free and people can pursue their individual interests. But he said democracy is, is like a, an embroidery of many colors. It's pretty, but it's unstable because it leads to chaos. And uh, if we want to have stability, if what we want, if our end goal is stability and wisdom and a just society governed by, by wise philosophers... Uh, as opposed to uh, uh, politicians or, uh, you know, sophists or people like that, then we need to uh, protect the stability of that society by forbidding poets and artists and others from criticizing uh, the leaders. So Plato was very practical. But uh, now come along, especially since the uh, French Revolution and the Enlightenment, come along this idea that there are intrinsic human rights. Uh, which are simply true, sort of like objective morality, sort of like not killing is, is an objective truth, according to many. Uh, now we uh, hold, especially in uh, you know, Western liberal democracies, that um, there are uh, basic universal human rights, including freedom of speech, which have an intrinsic value, regardless of the consequences. Uh, now that's not absolute, because there are limitations. I'm going to argue. I do argue. I do find in my research that that uh, there are limitations, even even in the United States, which actually has an expanded uh, view of freedom of speech compared to Canada. There still are limitations. But uh, I think that the underlying principle behind freedom of speech in uh, liberal democracies, like the United States and Canada, is that there's an intrinsic right. So I think that's 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 important. Now I, I think that that's more pronounced in the American view, whereas Canada has has uh, recognizes there's an intrinsic right, but it it that that intrinsic right to freedom of speech is more easily overruled or supplanted or trumped by other practical principles or maybe by by other intrinsic rights. Uh, 
but and I'll get to that after giving you a chance to, to, to speak but I just wanted to lay the seedbed here for for what I'm going to talk about I, I just want to point out that um, that compared to Plato who did not seem to view freedom of speech in any way as a universal right in uh, post French Revolution post enlightenment liberal society freedom of speech is viewed as uh, as as an intrinsic universal uh, human right, and I think that's that brings up a lot of you know at on some level that brings up some of the most important uh, like metaphysical grounds for like what we're for freedom of speech and why we should even talk about it. And I think my own view lands more in that um, intrinsic right, and and reason being like I mentioned at the beginning is autonomy and. I think we can kind of think about that in a sort of Kantian sense where, you know, we operate, we operate as if we are free, whether or not we are or not is like, like that becomes another discussion, but we operate as if we are free and freedom of speech, which is, you know, is the idea of essentially by uh, the idea of human autonomy uh, of the individual and freedom of speech is because we are discursive beings freedom of speech is the right that reflects that fact about who and what we are and how we operate um and then it also serves a practical there is a practical side which you know a, a lot of people like mill and uh milton and others brought up which is that it's a marketplace of an of of ideas and it's a it's a way to get everything out there put it all on the table and essentially we can imagine us all sitting around a big table throwing every idea down and being like which ones are good which ones are bad which ones make sense um you know push those off to the side keep these in the center um and that's uh, you know an ongoing evolving process but it's an open process and it's the process that allows for um not only does it allow for the most respect for human autonomy, but it's also the process that allows for the most ideas to come to light and the most scrutiny and the most um, sort of forward forward movement would be the argument from a lot of, uh, of uh, sort of enlightenment and post-enlightenment kind of thinkers, political thinkers. But I'm interested to see what, what else do you have to say, especially when you start to look at that in comparison to Canada and the United States. Because I do know as well that there are some differences in kind of the style that we go about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let me point out uh, first that uh, where where the Canada where Canada and the United States are similar, and, and this is important because uh, both Canada and the United States are juggling um, on one hand the recognized principle or the asserted principle <laughs> if you're if you're skeptical. Uh, of, 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 of freedom of speech as being a universal, innate, intrinsic human right, but at the same time fully aware of the consequences if that right is absolute. Uh, you know, of course, we're all familiar with the, you know, uh, yelling fire in a crowded theater example. It, it uh, doesn't seem yeah. viable. I mean, maybe you disagree. Maybe some people are for absolute freedom of speech, but let me, let me um, tell you what is similar between the U.S. and Canada uh, as a starting point. So in the United States, I'm going to read a little bit from my paper. In the United States, the First Amendment to the Constitution prohibits laws abridging freedom of speech. So, uh, but is it absolute? Well, no, because the Supreme Court, in interpreting the Constitution over the decades and centuries, uh, has allowed exceptions. In other words, allowed certain laws abridging freedom of speech of speech to stand for for practical reasons so uh yeah. examples are laws in, against inciting violence provoking a fight false statements of fact that would be like libel and slander obscenity child pornography and copyright infringement now some of those are would be criminal and some would be civil matters but in any case civil or criminal civil or criminal laws have been allowed to stand in the united states which um uh prohibit um freedom of speech when when, when the speech falls into those categories although you might maybe some people think those things should be allowed 
I, w I would suggest that many, if not most people, would, would agree that well, child pornography is not something that should be mm -hmm. uh, fall under the yeah. protection of freedom of speech. And and you can say that's par maybe for practical reasons, but also maybe because because we have to balance other intrinsic rights. So perhaps children have an intrinsic right not to be abused. Or, uh, you know, you could say that yelling fire in a crowded theater, uh, sure, it's a practical matter. You don't want people to be injured or stampede the, um, in a stampede, but maybe that's also because there's an intrinsic right for people to uh, be safe from harm. And someone yelling fire in a crowded theater is exposing that person to danger. So maybe it's not so much a practical issue, but it's an issue of competing intrinsic rights. You can look at it in different ways. So what about Canada? So uh, Canada is similar. The uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects fundamental freedoms. That's in Section 2. Uh, but Section 1 of the Charter permits laws which impose reasonable limits upon those freedoms. So restrictions in Canada under Section 1 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms include obscenity, and uh, and and now and this is not similar to the United States, hate speech. That's the big one. That's, That's the big uh, one. This yeah. is where they diverge. So what I'm asserting here, what I found in my research, is that the United States, neither explicitly or in case law, as decided by the Supreme Court over the decades, has any prohibition against hate speech. That's the difference, and Canada does. Uh, yeah, and that becomes, yeah. as I said, I, I thought that was, re everything that you brought was really interesting. On the American front, that uh, relates uh, directly back to what we were kind of talking about earlier with in terms of context, right? Like, all of those, whether it be di defamation, liable, um, fighting words, whatever it might be, all of those, what's rooted in, in those sorts of distinctions is, at least in my view, is not so much the content of holding a, of holding or even expressing a particular opinion, the context of expressing that opinion. Why why is someone saying what they're saying in what way? Right, like um, the, the the classic example is a theater, but also fighting words. Right, so you know we can take the exact same word. Let's say you know I I effing hate blue people. Right, now if I'm saying that in my own house alone, just hanging out, it really doesn't matter. If I'm saying that in a blue person, get it to a blue person getting up in their face and yelling, and I effing hate blue people, um, that that's where the distinction lies, and that's where, at least in the United States, where then the limits on free speech come in, because it's no longer what what's happening is you're no longer just expressing an opinion, you are also trying to influence the you could call it the material world, the material situation in some way that is harmful by the words that you are speaking. What gets more complicated then is hate speech, because while I think some articulations of hate speech definitely do fall under that, there are other articulations of hate speech where it becomes about, um, be careful with it, but it, it, there are, there's, there's some articulations of hate speech where it starts to become about hurt feelings or psychological harm or personal displeasure. Um, and this is particularly obvious when speech is not directed personally at any one individual. Um, but then speakers are, you know, asked to be or tried to be silenced by people who may not even be there, may not even be directly be involved, because they don't like what essentially what they are expressing. Uh, I think is the kind of is at least a part of what the kind of discussion now is. Yeah. So just to be clear, uh, from my research, I determined that in principle, and I'm saying in principle because the edges are a little bit jagged, right? So because you gave me an example of uh, someone who stood up on, in, on the street uh, in the streets of Vancouver and uh, with, with anti what anti gay property anti gay and, yeah and and got away with it, right? Um, yeah, and then, and then, you know, whereas you would think in Canada that would fall under hate speech and should be prohibited, so there's a jagged edge, and another jagged edge is in the United States, where uh, where hate speech is not prohibited, but incitement to violence is. You have uh, Trump. Now we're talking about President Trump, who uh, on many occasions 
you know, clearly incited violence and yet is a free man, uh, perhaps because he was president. Uh, so there's jagged edges, but the important thing is that in, in the United States, hate speech is not prohibited. This, the hmm. U.S. Supreme Court has struck down laws that, at lower, you know, from lower, passed by lower jurisdictions, states and municipalities and so on, prohibiting uh, hate speech. In Canada, it's quite different. The, Can the Canada, Supreme Court of Canada has upheld laws prohibiting hate speech. And uh, the what I wrote here is that um, the United States Supreme Court historically and consistently strikes down laws which restrict, restrict speech, including hate speech, unless it falls into one of the categorical exceptions. And here's an example of where the U.S. draws the line. And that would be incitement where there is an imminent danger of physical violence. Even hate-filled speech which merely advocates use of force but does not cause or threaten to cause imminent violence is not sufficient to warrant an exception to the First Amendment. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that came out of a major case before the U.S. Supreme Court, Brandenburg versus, versus Ohio in 1969. Uh, then I wrote that further attempts by universities in the United States to regulate hate speech were frequently overturned in the courts. So that's very profound. So in theory, if I get up uh, on a pulpit in the United States and say, you know, I mean, I don't even want to say it. I think that all X people should be Y, right? Should be Y. This should happen to them, right? Unless there's an imminent threat of violence, imminent meaning as a direct result of what I'm saying, uh, uh, th that would be protected speech. Well, I think in the United, I think even in the United I, States, yeah. But yeah, let's say you know, like let's let's say what was what we're saying here, like it, it, you know, uh, it, let's say we're American and someone gets up and says, "I think all blue people should be killed" or whatever, right? I think that there is a lot of, and I would have to do more reading on this, but there there is a lot of uh, interpretation going on in the um, in 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 the sort of. Uh, court procedures and stuff in terms of whether or not that would be that would be expressing an imminent harm right because it's certainly an incitement of violence right it's saying i i i am i believe that something should happen to these people or these people should be harmed um i think there's a strong case to be taken out uh, taken against uh, that kind of talk i think where the united states is particularly pr protected though is in the united states you could publish a newspaper that is overtly racist, right? It might not, it might not um, make any claims or pressures to what you should do with that racism. It could say a whole bunch of stuff about how, you know, white people are superior to black people or da 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 da, da right? And all these sorts of reasons. Um, and that would be protected. Um, whereas in Canada, that would be considered hate speech and would never, would never, um, would never fly. I don't think it would, at least, at, at least from my understanding. But. I th I think there's an underlying cultural difference, and this is I'm I'm going a little bit into my own understanding. Um, an under some underlying but significant fundamental cultural differences between Canada and the United States that that fuel this difference in in a, in the in, in the respective countries approach to hate speech where in the US it's generally protected and Canada it's not uh, protected um, and i think the united states has a history a cultural history of highly valuing individual freedom freedom. So I've, I've always uh, asserted that the U.S. culture is very almost obsessed with freedom. That comes out on the libertarianism, you know, which is prevalent in 
many segments of American society. This idea of freedom. Don't tread on me. I'm free. I can do what I want. But that's not so much part of Canadian culture. I think Canadian culture, in my assessment, is less concerned with freedom and more concerned with rights and equality and responsibility and protection. The you know, equal right, the rights of not that it's uh, always been come out in in the practical society, but in theory at least, the rights of uh, uh, of minorities, the rights of indigenous people, the rights of uh, uh, people to follow their own uh, drummer, right, to follow their own um, you know sexual orientations and so on. And so that 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 manifests in this uh, discrepancy over interpretation of freedom of speech. So the United States is, is therefore very reluctant to take away people's freedom to say whatever they want, so long as it doesn't cross, you know, uh, certain boundaries. But those boundaries are much more open than the Canadian boundaries. In Canada, the reason that hate speech is not protected is because something trumps freedom. Something trumps the freedom of people to speak hate speech. In Canada, there's more concern over the rights of people that are harmed by that hate speech. So the, the rights of vulnerable minorities who might be harmed by those exercising hate speech. That's more important in Canada. In the United States, rights take back seat to freedom. In Canada, rights are more important than freedom. That's how I'm going you know, to characterize it. So uh, here, here's what I wrote in my paper sort of supporting that. The prevailing Canadian approach might be described as freedom with responsibility. Statute is officially viewed as a legitimate method for countering embedded racism and bigotry. So... Uh, I quoted an author here, Canada's human rights law is a product of the, of the 1960s when much of our society truly was shot through with bigotry and prejudice. Um, hate speech remains criminalized by the Criminal Code of Canada and by many provincial statutes because those statutes are designed to counter the bigotry and prejudice which has been part of Canadian history. So in Canada, s legislation, regulation, statutes are seen as a legitimate remedy or protection for people that have been, whose rights have been violated because of bigotry and prejudice. In the United States, it's about freedom to be bigoted, freedom to be prejudiced, freedom to express your bigotry and prejudice. That's more important than the consequences. So I, think, I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I get where you're coming from and I get the Canadian position. I think, though, that the, 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 the response to that is that the American conception makes very clear and defined lines on what is and is not acceptable. Canadian conception does it. Hate, and, hate speech is a very open concept, and in particular, it's an open concept because it relies on self-report of psychological or personal harm. The other side, I think the response of American would be that it's not about the official position of the community or about the official positions of the state. It's about individuals expressing what they want to express. So, you know, peoples can still be respected in how they're treated by the community writ large. That doesn't necessarily, you know, that nece is necessarily affected by some idiot, you know, spewing off garbage, you know, on his like personal forum or whatever, right? The issue with starting to try and legislate against that is, I think, that twofold. One, you start, I think it's threefold. One, you start regulating against personal, human, uh, personal autonomy or freedom, which I think is, is a legitimate concern, right? The, the 
second first point is connected to the second point, which is how do you determine where that stops and where that starts, right? Especially when the concerns are so personal and oftentimes so vague. And the third is that I wrote it somewhere here. Um, if the integrity of a liberal society is in the enactment of liberal principles, such as the respect for human human autonomy, whatever that is, um, is it more is certain speech really more damaging to that integrity? So is it is it really more damaging that certain people say ridiculous stuff, or is legislating against the speech more damaging? So in a sense, is is having a self contradiction in the structure of the societal project more damaging than what one or however many individuals think or speak or say within certain very clearly defined limitations if if we accept that freedom of speech is 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 not or should not be absolute so that i, I understand that maybe people who think it should be then, yeah and that's then definitely what yeah, yeah no yeah then it's merely a question of where do we draw the line. So once we once we've abandoned the idea of absolute freedom of speech, then we agree. So let's say hypothetically that you uh, fall on the Canadian side and I fall on the American side. I'm not saying I do. In fact, I probably don't. But uh, uh, that, I then, probably do fall more on the American side. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, more so. But what yeah. we agree on is that there there needs to be constraints on freedom of speech. Yep, so we're totally. not ar we're not arguing that we're simply arguing where the the line should be. So uh, yeah, and I think that that's the main argument. Right. So now so now I, what I wanted to get to, uh, you know, actually the the truth of the matter is for me personally I don't have a strong side here. I I do tend to get opinionated about many topics, but this is not one of them. This is one where I'm a true philosopher. I in the, in the you know in the Bertrand Russell tradition I really see. Um, I really see strong arguments on both sides, and, and I'm not sure, you know, where, where I stand. I, it, you know, I was taught in my by, my, by some of my great professors at VIU um, mm -hmm. to, uh, especially, you know, um, uh, well, I, I won't say names, but I was taught to, as a philosopher, to 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 weigh, you know, to make argue to. to extract research and extract the best arguments on both sides of an issue and 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 to honestly weigh them and to look at the best arguments not suppress arguments or try and uh, trick people into believing my position and be a sophist and you know but rather to to really bring out what are the best arguments on this side what are the best arguments on that side so i wanted to take that approach here really quickly because in my paper i came up with what i thought were a couple of pretty good arguments on each side so Argument for criminalization of hate speech. So maybe that we would say the the Canadian yeah. side. It's a state's prerogative, prerogative, further its responsibility, proponents argue, to balance freedom of speech with competing interests. Even in countries where freedom of speech is most broadly protected, such as the United States, it is not a, absolute. It's a question of where to draw the line. So we already said that. There are competing values at play, freedom of spe speech versus respect for others, including minorities. And I quoted the British Lord Bhikkhu Parekh, who uh, wrote, although free speech is an important value, it's not the only one. Human dignity, equality, freedom to live without harassment and intimidation, social harmony, mutual respect, and protection of one's good name and honor are also central to the good life and deserve to be safeguarded. Because these values conflict, either inherently or in a particular context, they need to be balanced. Proponents of the Canadian interpretation argue that Canada achieves a reasonable balance between the competing <coughs> interests. The Supreme Court of Canada, uh, in, a, in a ruling uh, Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission versus Watcott in tw 2013, uh, upheld Saskatchewan's anti-hate laws stating that they address a pressing and substantial issue and are proportional to the objective of tackling causes of discriminatory activity to reduce the harmful effects and social costs of dis discrimination. And there's another argument, I'll let you re respond in a minute, Hill. Um, yeah. 
another argument in favor of the uh, Canadian approach um, uh, prohibiting hate speech, there, which is the morals and symbols argument. The Canadian government government must take a clear principled stand against hatred and violence. Not only does the government serve as a role model for its citizens, uh, but also uh, on the world stage. And then finally, there is international precedent for blocking hate speech. Two United Nations agreements prohibit incitement to racial or religious discrimination or hatred. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Uh, uh, Br uh, Brian later uh, qu quoted, stated, such hate, sp hate speech regulation is unconstitutional content-based uh, regulation of speech in the U.S., but is common in most other we Western democracies. So, so what he's saying is that the U.S. is an anomaly. The U.S. is an outlier. Most Western democracies... Uh, uh, have laws banning hate speech for the reasons given above. So those are some some of what I thought are some pretty strong arguments in favor of the Canadian position. So I'll let you respond. Then I'll then I'll later I'll give the uh, other arguments on the other side. Yeah, I think um, so. I think my my response would be particularly to the to British Lord Piku Harek, whose name I can't pronounce. Where he says, although freedom of speech is an important value, it is not the only one. Human dignity, equality, freedom to live without harassment, intimidation, social harmony, mutual respect and protection, one's good name and honor are also central to a good life and deserve to be safeguarded. So I think that the response on the other side would be that the more open uh, or American unquote, style already does protect against that stuff. There isn't this belief that there is as much of a clash between free speech and these other elements of life. Like, look, the what what the american conception or that we might call like the pure conception of free speech is purely freedom of expression basically the ability for people to say in the open marketplace of ideas even if their idea is stupid i think x or i believe x right um where those where those other elements come into play i would argue such as human dignity equality freedom to live without harassment intimidation social harmony um particularly the freedom to live without harassment um and, and, and stuff like that is when those um, when those when those speech act is is not a speech act of pure expression um, but is a speech act of, of incitement or or violence or engagement in some kind of context again the context is really what matters right so basically there is no limitation on the sort of uh, expression police or there is no expression police in that sort of way you, you can say you believe whatever you want um like in theory now in practice obviously that becomes much more complicated because generally things are not said in some pure you know pure open forum they generally do have a speech act associated and so lots of stuff in in the united states or many other countries is, is actively regulated in terms of what people can say and do right very rarely do people just express pure opinions um, but it's it, there is a much more clearly defined line there in terms of like hey like uh this is um i was losing my train of thought there but anyways I'll, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll end with that on that point um i also personally don't like the morals and symbols argument but i think what would go off in other directions a little bit if we start talking about that but yeah i'll let you i'll let you continue yeah so in in my paper i cited went on to cite some of the um arguments against the criminalization of hate speech mm -hmm. so and, and my first point is one that you just made um i said that uh it's true that freedom of speech cannot be absolute there there will always be interpretation involved uh, such as in determining whether the expression was incitement to violence, and you alluded to that before. Uh, if someone in the United States, if somebody gets up and uh, you know says that all blue people should be killed, that's a, that could be a question of interpretation. Was that a direct incitement to violence, or is that simply a permitted type of hate speech? <laughs> but anyway, um, but a, I say a call to action is different in kind. Than expressing a mere viewpoint, we may have to just 
debate whether that was a call to action or expression of a viewpoint, but at least in principle, there's a difference in kind. And that's where the line is in the U.S. No matter how hateful, merely expressing a viewpoint uh, is, 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 is a difference in kind than calling uh, violence to action or calling action to violence. So there is a according to this response, um, there is a logical way of distinguishing between uh, uh, what's permitted, which is a viewpoint, uh, expressing a viewpoint, versus what's not permitted, which is an actual call to action. So that helps justify the U.S. approach um, by saying that there's a logical distinction, and, and that's the line that the U.S. has chosen. Um, further, it is argued, freedom of speech is a hollow concept. This, I think, is probably the most powerful argument um, in favor of the U.S. position. Freedom of speech is a hollow concept if it only exists when the content is pleasant, non-controversial, and non-offensive. It is precisely when speech is disagreeable and even offensive to many that it tests a society's commitment to the principle of freedom of speech. Certainly, such a deep commitment, commitment is not conditional upon content being agreeable to the majority. Freedom of speech pertains to the act of expression regardless of the content, but without an exception for mere opinion. So that argument says that what, what the Canadian approach is doing is saying, well, we permit freedom of speech so long as it's not too objectionable. But yeah. the response is, well, that's precisely when we test, when your commitment to freedom of speech is tested. When the speech is, you know, when, it, when it's not objectionable, when it's not hateful, anyone can say, okay, you have freedom to do that. But when it comes to the speech that is hateful, that's when you're tested as your commitment to freedom of speech. Yeah, and it becomes the, the bench, and this is what we were talking about earlier, I got a couple things to say there, and I, and I really, I, I do, I want to say, I generally agree with that, and that the benchmark becomes, the problem, especially with a lot, and I want to say, like, I, I'm not like a hate speech scholar, and I do think that there's a lot of stuff that we would find under the rubric of hate speech that would fall under already fall under all sorts of, of reasons why it wouldn't be permitted anyways. But there's certain very, um, I think, very topical, you know, when the discussion of hate speech comes up, which is sort of like, you know, the banning, the, the preemptive banning of saying any sort of class of things, expressing any sort of this, this opinion, this, the idea behind it is you're not allowed to express this opinion, basically, uh, in the public forum. I think that that it's yeah it's if, if we're going to have freedom of speech part of the point of freedom of speech is to get all the ideas uh um out there so that we can as a community interpret which ones are good which ones are bad why they're good why they're bad and sort of move forward as, as to what makes up the the you know the common consciousness or discourse the other thing too um, and this is something that Mill talks about, which is a fallibility principle, which is that lots of things that people agreed with or disagreed with, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago, turned out to be true, turned out to actually be the right opinion. And if we just ban people from saying certain classes of stuff, we run the risk of banning people from discussing things that might actually turn out to be useful or helpful in some way. Now, that might seem like there's certain types of speak, and I think it's the kind of speak that most people think about when they think of hate speech. It's pretty obvious. Um, but the argument would be that, you know, like four or 500 years ago, there were lots of things that people thought were super obvious um, that turned out to, you know, not be the case. Um, so if we start going down that road, and, uh, and part of that, again, is, again, going back to especially in the common cult current cultural context, a lot of what's considered hate speech is based around per individuals' personal displeasure with public um, expressions of opinion, someone's public expression of opinion. And that becomes a very muddy line in turn for what you know, is or is not hate speech. Um, and in some sense, it, you know, it's the slippery slope fallacy, but there, I, I do think it holds some water in terms of the fact of, you know, like well, that line is very, it moves very easily. Um, and if I, something offends me, right, so we say ban people from saying that thing, well, that's not a very good metric for understanding like what we should and should not be, what we should and should not be legislating against. 
there is a side note to be said here in the fact that there's a difference between political or legal legislation and cultural cultural social practical exclusion right? which is that most of the things that people already say is hate speech are um they're already excluded practically from most venues right because people don't agree people already just don't agree and i think somewhere in your article someone actually pointed out saying like look like what does freedom what does the restriction actually do it doesn't actually change anything a lot of the stuff that people uh we're like we're, we're trying to ban people from saying is already on the margins of the public discourse um and i think there's an additional argument to that which is that when you ban something it gives more power to the thing that you're banning instead of having it out in the open and it allows it to to fester and congregate and, and to consolidate into something more serious than it was before so yeah, um, we're almost out of time, but I have a couple. Uh, I'll briefly uh, state a couple other arguments um, in favor of the uh, uh, American position rather than the Canadian. So, here I'm going to quote an editorial from the Toronto Star in 2012. <laughs> the Toronto Star stated, "Quote: Free speech shouldn't be taken as a license to preach racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, or other evils in the media or anywhere else." So that's, in a nutshell, you know, the, the Canadian position. But the problem with that, and this is the response to that, the problem with that, mm. it, um, it treats free speech as though it was a privilege granted discretionally by governments. It might, now, this statement that free speech shouldn't be, uh, uh, give you protection to uh, preach racism, homophobia, etc., it might sound reasonable, but now this is sort of a slippery slope argument. A censor could substitute other types of speech into that sentence, such as free speech shouldn't be taken as a license to preach subversion. Free speech shouldn't be taken as a license to preach blasphemy. <laughs> and, and, now, and, now, and now we're you know, getting into uh, authoritarian types of governments. So this speaks to the fundamental question of, is free speech, we're coming full circle, which is what I wanted to do, an intrinsic right? Or is it a right that's granted discretionally by the government? If it's the la uh, former, then the U.S. approach would seem to be more coherent. If it's the latter, then the Canadian approach would be more coherent because the Canadian approach is to grant free speech when it uh, is not uh, harmful to uh, vulnerable people. Discretionary. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I, I brought out some of the, I think, some of the arguments on each side. And I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. Yeah, I definitely, as I think it's clear to you and my audience, I definitely tend more towards what we're calling here the American position. Or we might call them more like, I, I, I think, the traditional or liberal position again i'm certainly not advocating absolutist speech but i i find it hate speech and um the the, the like of that kind of stuff though particularly the legislating against it right i find to be concerning and in fact in some ways it's contradictory to if we're if we, like you're talking about there if hate speech is if freedom of speech sorry is going to be a intrinsic principle of our society of, of our humanity then on some level it's um it's contradictory to that and it's more contradictory than allowing people to say stupid stuff so that's <laughs> kind of my my position yeah, I'm going to wrap up my uh, my um, ex expression of you know this, uh, not so much as an opinion, but I I think that this parallels in some ways the distinction between consequentialist and non-consequentialist moral positions. Mm -hmm. The the American position on where hate speech is tolerated is more of a non-consequentialist position. There's an intrinsic uh, 
value in allowing free speech, even if it's hate speech, regardless of the consequences. Whereas the Canadian approach is more consequentialist, that uh, uh, hate speech shouldn't be permitted merely because it's intrinsically, we have an intrinsic right to it. We have to look at the consequences of hate speech. We have to balance the consequences with the advantages of the freedom. So, yeah, that, that, that's what I would end with. Can, the Canada is more concerned with the consequences. The U.S. is more concerned with the intrinsic right. Yeah, and I think my, my add or addendum to that would be that, yeah, I agree. I think Canada is more interested in preempting the consequences, whereas the United States is more interested in let it, having uh, free speech be primary. Is It's not, I agree, it's a non-consequentialist view. But then look, dealing with the consequences individually, right? There are certain times when there will be consequences and there will be certain times where there won't be. But we're not going to legislate categorically against it. We're going to deal with each situation kind of as they as they arise. Great. Thanks. Time's up. <laughs> Time's up. That was good. Thanks, Hale. The Canadian Philosophy Show. I'm Michael Robert Kaditz. We're both uh, currently, uh, you were currently and I was associated with VIU. Proud of VIU. <laughs> Thanks, Hale. Good. Good discussion. Thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs> oh, well, we went over. I'll have to cut out a couple of minutes somehow, somewhere. Let's see. Uh, usually I can cut it down a couple of minutes by editing out blank space, you know, okay. when there's like a, people think. But although with the two of us, we kind of kept the, kept it going the whole time, but I'll figure it out. All right, let's make sure I got uh, recordings here. I'll turn off. Thanks. I don't know if we have any viewers on YouTube, but thanks for watching. Uh, <laughs>